This is the Mile High Five podcast with Carl Jensen and Doug Cunnington. We have authentic conversations about the journey to Phi, health, happiness, and some very odd tangents. We interview Phi experts, side hustlers, people on their way to Phi, and those who have reached the other side. Join us every week, and if you want the show notes and links and all that other stuff, head over to milehighfi.com. Hello, world. Welcome to the Mile High Fi podcast. I'm Carl Jensen with my co-host. I'm Doug Cunnington. Doug, how did you feel about that introduction? I tried to be a little silkier and smoother. It sounds good. It sounds really good. I don't know. Are you getting some kind of tea to coat your throat or something like that? No, no. I, I've often thought I should go for voice coaching or watch some YouTube videos, though. And I think that came from one of them. Try to talk slow and enunciate and all that, which I'm not always good at. So I'm trying to pay attention. I think it sounds sultry. Nice. Is that the right word? That is exactly what I went for there, Doug. So I appreciate you saying that. Success. (laughs) So what are we talking about today? We're going to talk about something I've always found kind of interesting and maybe a little strange. We're going to talk about rich versus wealthy. So whenever I've heard that in the past, Doug, I've always thought they're kind of the same thing. What do you think? I think they're different. And I probably I probably didn't think about it too closely and just kind of lump them together as well. But I've been listening to a lot of Morgan Housel's podcasts and read his couple books in the last month or so. So I think he talked about it and it kind of triggered it in my mind. And I'm like, oh, I've kind of observed a lot of the observations he had. And I thought it'd be a cool thing to talk about. So I think at this point, they're definitely different. And you did some research ahead of time to actually separate them and talk about the differences. So what do you have for us? I did. I have a definition. And Doug, I'm going to attempt to read it in that same voice. Rich versus wealthy. Being wealthy And actually, I have to expand my text because my eyes are old and I can't read anything. Being rich means you can afford reading glasses and that you remember to bring them. Okay, They're right in front of you. The glasses are right there. (laughs) Here we go. Rich versus wealthy. (laughs) Being wealthy and being rich are two different things. Being wealthy means being financially independent and having a large net worth. When you're rich, you have a high income but you could also have a lot of debt. So it doesn't necessarily mean you are wealthy. Is that how you have always thought about it, Doug? You know, back in the day, I'm not, I don't remember what I thought, but now I see that because like you see someone with say like some ni- a nice car, say like a Tesla Model Y, for example. <laughs> and you think, wow, that person must be rich. They may or may not be rich or wealthy, Right. So you have to kind of pull it apart and to get an expensive car or an expensive house or whatever, you probably at least have to have the income to support borrowing that money. You could be wealthy and pay for it outright. But if you see like a, a fancy car in a fancy house, you probably can assume that they have enough income. I guess I'm talking myself out. I'm like, oh, it could be either one, right? Yeah, you don't know. Right. So it's been eye-opening because I, I mean, when I think back, especially when I was, say, in my 20s and we all just got jobs and people are getting like super fancy cars, I'm like, I'm pretty sure they, based on the fact that we're getting paid the same thing, like they probably are spending a huge amount of their income on like that car. Cause I know that car is like a $50,000 car back in 2002 or something like that. I think that's a pretty good definition. And I guess I hadn't thought about it like that. It It's pretty interesting because none of these things, like we alluded to, you can't figure it out. It's not outwardly apparent, except maybe the rich part, if that's going to be your definition of rich is defined by your income, then obviously you can't, have these nice physical objects if you don't have the income, if you're not rich, if that's the definition you're going to go with. But wealthy is something completely different because there's a lot of wealthy people, and I'll throw myself on the bucket, that don't look wealthy. One of our neighbors thought we were destitute because I'd be out there working on the cars. And at the time, we had like a 2003 Honda Element, which we still have, but we had a 2010 Mazda 5. And 
they weren't very nice. So it was kind of amusing that these people who we know for a fact did struggle with money because we would hear their arguments from their house out their window. They're screaming at each other about money and they thought we were destitute. I feel there's a lot of nuance to these things. And we'll, we'll talk about when we thought we were wealthy and or rich, you know, in our past. So we'll come around to that. But it's really interesting when you think about the wealth aspect where we have old cars as well. I have like a, now a 16 year old truck and I dress a, probably a little bit better than you, but not much, you know. <laughs> I've tried to get some jeans over at Costco and Sam's, but they didn't have my size. Ah. So like I've been trying, but do you have some weird size? Like you've got, I think I have longer legs than you. I think you do too. (laughs) I saw you looking at me. I was wondering what that was all about, but now I know what size jeans do you wear? I need a 30 size waist. Okay. I have a very uh, petite Filipino, uh, you know how my hips are pretty, pretty small. Yeah. I've seen them. (laughs) <laughs> it, w- how about length? How is your length? It's longer than you would think, you know, longer. How, how long do you, th- well, no. Yeah. I need like 30 thirties. And I think the, the typical stuff is a uh, 32 30. Cause I, I actually tried to buy a pair of pants, but they were, um, they were a little too baggy. Okay. I'll be so. on the lookout for you. If I ever see 30 thirties, I will pick some up for you. All right. I think I might have to order them. Anyway, back on topic here. I have an old car and I dress like, like we, we just outwardly, it doesn't look like we have any money at all. Right. I'm cooking at home all the time. We don't go out to eat very often, but it's just like what we enjoy. And we've, we figured that out. So that's the tricky part. Like you can't see wealth necessarily. It can be completely hidden. And if they're actually like pretty wealthy, then you probably won't see it. Yeah. I think maybe we need a, a third word here, or maybe Rich already covers about what would you call people who have a lot of debt, but that outwardly look flashy. Would that be a version of rich or do we need, is there a better word to describe that phenomenon? I can't think of another word. Maybe if you want to come up with something, yeah. Yeah. Something that rhymes is always good. (laughs) I'll I'll give it some thought, but it is pretty interesting. I feel in in some cases, I don't want to stereotype everyone, but I often wonder, and this probably comes from my own personal experiences, but the people who have a lot of that fancy stuff are the ones who don't really have the money. They're the ones who struggle the most and might be living a paycheck to paycheck situation. And I wonder if that's why they buy the fancy thing, they know their struggle, so they they know that they struggle, so they want to project something else to the rest of the world. And I think there could be a piece, and I'm thinking of a, a friend of mine in particular, where I think he had a chip on his shoulder and he wanted to show people that he was successful. So he got a fancier car than what he really needed. And well, and I'm not here to tell him what he needed or whatever, but he was like super proud of his car. And you know what? No one gives a fuck about your car. Like no one really gives a fuck about your car at all, except you probably. If it did make him happy, that's great. But it wasn't immediately clear that the car did that at all. So, and I know you're a car guy, Carl, right? I mean, you, you enjoy them. Yes. So it makes sense if that is a thing that you're, interested in and it does make you happy totally makes sense like we're not we're not trying to tell you what to do we're just judging people (laughs) i mean this whole this whole episode it's very obvious now we're just judging people right yeah we're kind of assholes that's what we should title this we are assholes (laughs) but people probably judge us too it's like ah why is he driving that crappy car he's always home like they're they're talking about me of, of course but yeah, I was going to say along those same lines, I've been judged because people know we have money and don't spend it. So people are like, well, what's what's the matter with you? Like, why aren't you spending this? I'm like, ah, oh. and maybe they have a point, but strange. All right. So anything else on like rich versus wealthy or things people should think about 
based on our definition, I think the goal should always be wealth. I think uh, rich might be a poor manifestation of your ego. It, you're not doing it for your inner scorecard. You're doing it because of the projection for other people, which is not good. And to bring sort of like a balanced thought around this, I agree generally. However, like I said before, if it's something that you value and you or your family or your friends get something out of it, I think in air quotes, like if you're, if you're flashy, that is totally okay. Like only you can determine what is a good value for you. No one else can. So generally I agree with the, the wealth portion. If you're doing it for what we are deeming the right reason in our ivory tower, <laughs> then, then it works. But it's a slippery slope if you're like, all right, I just got to be, I got to have like a little bit nicer car than my neighbors down the street. Just the classic keeping up with the Joneses, which you're never going to keep up, right? There's always going to be someone a little bit more. Once you get to wherever you think you're going, you're going to change and move the goalpost to something even farther out. Yeah, it's, it's difficult. I think a lot of people, I completely agree with what you said there too, but I'll also add I don't think a lot of people really know what makes them happy. Like I've, I've had relatives who are like one, one of the guys is a farmer and they're pretty like a stereotypical farmer, very conservative with money and exactly how you would think in your mind's eye. And he's like, well, I, I think I should get this blah, 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 like new, like SUV thingy. I'm like, well, like, why is that? Is there something wrong with your old car? He's like, oh no, I just saw this commercial so, <laughs> yeah, it, 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 and, and this is a true story. So it always cracks me up. There, there's always people who are like, oh, is what would happen if everyone became fire? Is there a chance of this? Like, no, absolutely not. Because there's 5,000 people who listen to our episodes and there's a billion people who watch the Super Bowl with ads for all these shiny new objects. So I, I think people need to think deep about where true happiness comes from and it gets down to your values and like you said, a car might genuinely make someone happy. And there could be other stuff around that. Like when I, I did have a fancy car and the, the best thing about it was the community around it, like going to meet other like-minded car people and hanging out with them. And maybe I didn't need to have the car to get that, but it certainly helped. And that brought actually joy, but the actual ownership of the thing, not so much. And maybe that car answers this question, but like, do you have a current story where you get sucked in into some sort of consumerism where you're like, oh, I, I do kind of want that. And then you, you buy it. Anything like that, maybe in the last year or so, maybe it's like an electronic thing or travel headphones or something like that. Yeah. Like an unhappy purchase or a purchase I thought would be better than it, or that didn't turn out like I thought it would be. Oh, just any purchase where you're like, oh, that would be cool to own. And I'm, and you're like, oh, I'm going to treat myself and I'm going to buy that thing. Yeah. yeah. So I, I have stories on both sides of that, like good and bad. We've had some experiences like a helicopter ride, which was expensive, but definitely worth it. Super cool. I never done that before. It was awesome. Um, a really good pair of noise canceling headphones, like you alluded to, was great too. But on the flip side, we've done some experiments with food where we've gone to a, a nicer restaurant. We did this once in Hawaii and once in Chicago too. And one of them was, uh, and well, actually one in Las Vegas. So the Hawaii one was actually a, a restaurant owned by, who's that, Todd Rundgren, like some music artist? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know who that guy is. Another one was a Michelin star rated restaurant in Chicago. And the third one was one of the Brazilian steakhouses. And they were all good, but kind of a disappointment, not good enough to justify their price. They were memorable only because I thought they would be more memorable than they were, the food. And it wasn't. And that could be on me too. Maybe I just don't appreciate food like some people do. Interesting. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I love food and spent, I like, I have a lot of uh, productivity books back there, but I have a lot of cookbooks and I really enjoy cooking and eating and like the culture around it. And I often find like high end places disappointing most of the time. And I feel like, you know, it's a great community building thing. If you go out for a nice dinner or whatever, I think it can be more fun to go to like a cheap place, go to a, 
a hot dog place where they they wrap it in bacon and deep fry it. And then it's not too expensive. It's a little bit more interesting, in my opinion, and, or, or a diner or something. So I rather I would rather push it to the low end and eat like cheap carnival food. And it's more interesting to me than like, oh, yeah, we went to a Michelin star restaurant. Yeah. What do you think of that? Yeah, I think so too. One other thought is you don't have to spend a lot to have good food. Uh, the Michelin star restaurant I went to was a Mexican place and they're famous for their mole. And I went to Oaxaca where mole was invented and had pretty much the same meal for probably one twentieth of the price. So I don't think you have to spend a lot to have a really good meal. And one example, this kind of, uh, funny enough, Doug, this kind of changed my culinary existence. You told me to try uh, pokey in Hawaii. And, and I thought it was good, but it was the first time I had it. But since then, I've had it like 10 times, and it has become my default thing to order in a restaurant because it's a lot healthier than a cheeseburger, even though they might not have that kind of pokey. But it wasn't that expensive. It was just some place with a counter, and there was a big line of people there. And you you, you took the stuff to go, and, and that was it. And it wasn't any, it probably won't be on a Michelin star review or anything like that. But you don't have to have spent, you don't have to spend money to have a Really good food. Yeah. Great example is Topoki Shack. Is that the place you went? Yes. Yeah. And it's like, it's like in a parking lot. It looks like a little shack. Like it looks like nothing, but it's awesome. Yeah. It was great. I I want to go back to Hawaii and go there again now that I'm more familiar with it to try it once again. All right. Before we get into when we felt like we were rich and when we felt like we were wealthy, we have a sponsor today. It's our friends over at Ghostbed and our buddy Rich sent us an email and tried to sponsor the show for a while. We kept turning him down until we actually checked out the product. We each have one of the pillows, which are nice and cool. Carl and I both are hot sleepers. And you have a a story about sleeping at home you want to tell me about. Yeah, and there's actually a second part of it that I did not mention. Uh, The first part of it that I did mention is Mindy has been having some issues sleeping. She sleeps on her side and her hips hurt. So I think we're going to get a new mattress to see if that would solve it. And we'll probably go with a ghost bed. The other thing is I sleep very hot in my chili pad, which is this cooling pad that you put under your sheet and it pumps water through there to keep it cold. They're expensive and the thing just died. So if I could replace that with a mattress that would accomplish the same thing, that would be great because then I don't have another mechanical thing to break and it makes life a little bit simpler. So we're going to try one of these mattresses to see how cool they are because that is one of another one of their big features. They it's what is their tagline? It's the coolest the coolest bed in the world and it's seven layers, a lot like um, you know, those dips with beans and the guacamole, you know, the seven layer dip. It's like that, except a bed. Nice. And, and I know you don't need a new mattress, but we'll buy this thing and then uh, you and I could test it out. I mean, to be clear here, we're going to have a demarcation line down the middle. It would be like the one Three's Company episode where they had to be in there. I'm really dating myself with this, but <laughs> they had to put like tape down the middle of their apartment and they weren't allowed to cross the tape and all that. We'll have a, a line down the middle of the bed. I don't want to. I, I know the body pillow offer when I forgot mine, Doug, and that was very generous of you, but... I like my space when I sleep, and I know you sleep hot too, so we we need separation there, Doug. But anyway, I can't wait to try this mattress to see if it fixes Mindy's hips and it make to make me cooler. I have a little deeper question here. So you sleep on your side, and Mindy sleeps on her side, right? Yes. Do you guys face each other, or do you face away, or do you are you ambi sleeper side sleepers? I think we usually face away, but I sometimes I turn over a couple times. And, and one of her comments is like, oh, you need a body pillow. We should just snuggle on. You could use me as the body pillow. And that is absolutely off the table because I would just be way warmer and that would just be terrible. So Too much body heat. Too much body heat, yes. All right. Well, if you get one of those ghost bed mattresses, I would check out the Lux potentially, and you can get more details on the website. There are over 60,000 five-star reviews. They're a family-owned business. You get a 101-night at-home sleep trial, and they have a great warranty that is about double the industry standard. Go to ghostbed.com slash milehighfi, and you could use our code, Carl. You could save 50% site-wide. That includes bedding and the pillows and all the other accessories that you might need to sleep. Milehighfi is the 
discount code. So thanks a lot to Ghostbed. And this is going to come out before Economy, right, Doug? It should, probably. Okay. So in case it does, Rich will be at Economy. So if you have questions, you can talk to him, and hopefully he comes to our opening party Thursday night. And as we're transitioning out of this ad, if you are if you don't have your Economy ticket, we have a discount code, so we'll put that in the show notes. But Carl and I are going to be there. Mindy's going to be there. As far as I know, we're not sharing a room, all three of us, right? I hope not. What's that supposed to mean, man? It hurts my feelings. Well, I'll talk to Mindy and see what she says. Ooh, <laughs> she might have a different opinion. I, I don't know. Yeah, you might have to find your own room. Yeah, could be. All right. As we move into the next, we're just kidding around, by the way, just officially. So when did you feel like you were rich and or wealthy? You could answer them both at the same time. I felt rich when I got my first job right out of college because when I was in college, I had no money. I made minimum wage at the computer lab, which was uh, $3.35 an hour. Maybe it went up to four twenty-five. Doug, do you remember when minimum wage was, were those amounts? Roughly. Roughly, yeah. yeah. So my whole time in college, I lived in a, an apartment for the past two years. And my whole time in those apartments, I don't think I bought any meat product the whole time. So I was kind of an involuntary vegetarian. I would buy this big thing of spaghetti and the sauce, like the cheapest ragu crap, and make a big thing of that and just eat it the whole week for dinner and eat like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich for lunch. And I was probably a bit malnourished because of all this. So I remember when I got my first check, the first thing I did is go to the grocery store and buy one pound of ground beef, which is, and the fact that I remember it so clearly maybe <laughs> reflects how much it meant to me. But yeah, I felt rich when I could go do that and not feel bad about it. It was great. And how old were you? I was probably 24, 25. All right. Do you remember how much the ground beef cost back in those days? Yeah, it was like $3 a pound. All right. Nice. And well, I'll go and talk about when I felt rich. I was, I guess, 20. And my older sister, who's six years older than me, she needed to borrow money for her first house. So she had already, she was a farm or she is a pharmacist and she needed some extra cash for the down payment. And she borrowed like 2,500 bucks from me. And the fact that I had like 2,500 bucks cash when I was like 20 was, I was like my older sister that has like a real job, like needs to borrow the cash. And I just cut grass. So I didn't realize that I had like sort of an entrepreneurial spirit, but it makes sense now that I did bad at a corporate job where someone was telling me what to do. And now that I've worked for myself for eight years, I'm way happier. It's so much better. And I started cutting grass when I was like 12 or so. And I think I've told the story on the pod before, but started cutting grass, didn't know what the fuck I was doing. Just pushed the mower around and stopped at houses and then started passing out flyers and then word of mouth grew it. And I did that until I was, yeah, 20 some odd years old. I mean, I went to college and everything, but I would still like come back in the summer or if I had time and cut some grass as well. So I just saved up a ton of money didn't pay any, you know, it was a cash, cash business, you know? And, um, I don't think I ever hit the threshold where my parents had to report, but several years of just saving up. So how did your sister know? I mean, you were only 20 years old. You were still in college, right? Obviously. Or? Yeah. How did your sister know you even had $2,500 to loan her? I, I don't remember exactly, but I think maybe, Maybe my parents were a little proud and they were like, oh, Doug has like 10K in the bank or whatever. He's just been cutting grass and saving, blah, blah, blah. So maybe my sister knew. But I don't think I was like going around saying, hey, look how much money I have in my savings account or whatever. Was it in cash or was it like in, did you ever buy savings bonds as a kid or CDs? Yeah, savings bonds. I think it was mostly in uh, my checking account because I was using it to like pay for college and such. So I think I was just like saving up. It was never invested. I did have some savings bonds as like gifts um, as a kid. And I don't think that I purchased any myself though. Okay. And I assume this all worked out. Your sister paid you back and yeah, everyone was happy. Awesome. Yep. It was all good. Okay. Yeah. So, so that was that. When did you feel wealthy? 
I'll tell you that, but I want to go to one intermediate point. So I, I felt wealthy later than this, but my intermediate point is I felt great when we hit a million dollars in net worth. And I think that was around 2016. And I, I actually remember exactly where I was. I was at work. I was going to my job and I was on a train in Chicago going downtown and I popped open um, Empower, or it was called Personal Capital back then. I popped that open and it gave me some note like, congratulations, you're a millionaire. I'm like, holy crap, that's amazing. I got out and funny enough, I had a, a cheeseburger for dinner, another um, ground beef uh, <laughs> thing, food thing. You're a simple man. Yeah. yeah. So I felt really great then. And as stupid and as silly as this might sound, I don't think I really felt wealthy until probably last year. Okay. That does sound silly. It, it does. And I think... The reason is we finally, um, I'll back up a second. Before that, we really hadn't done anything with our money. We just put it, added it to the pile. So our net worth kept growing and growing and growing. And I probably didn't feel wealthy because we weren't acting like we had any wealth. So in 2023, we did some spending experiments like the concert, which you attended our helicopter ride, a fancy trip to Hawaii, another fancy one to New York. So maybe that reinforced the fact that we actually have money, and I don't know why it took that to feel that way, which is uh, pretty silly, but I'll, I'll own it. Interesting. And it was, I mean, it was really slowly over the period from like 2016 until last year when you slowly were like, we should probably spend a little bit of this. Yeah. And there's actually a more interesting point that I should have pointed out too. We actually weren't at our peak of net worth. We hit that and- 2021 with, I think, like 5 million. And we had since dropped down to, like, I think three and a half or four because all the crazy tech stocks I had did not do well. But we weren't even at our peak, but even at five, which is a great sum of money and very fortunate and thankful to have. <laughs> I didn't feel it back then. Yeah. And I remember because we recorded a couple episodes around the time period where it's like, man, the stock market's like hitting like all time highs. And then we've been, I think we're about to the same spot as we were, but you're, you have a lot more tech stocks, which weighs it down or lifts it up. Right. Correct. Interesting. Very cool. All right. Anything else on your end from the wealth standpoint? No, I'm kind of curious. Do you feel wealthy, Doug? I do. Yeah. I, and I have a couple, a couple points here. One is probably it was, my mid thirties or so. And it was around the time that we started tracking our net worth. We were accumulating enough money that we needed to figure out how to invest. I think we had like over six figures in like just a savings account or checking or whatever. And we fired our advisors because we realized they were doing a bad job and we were doing better than them. So no need to have those folks on the, on the payroll. Right. And I remember chatting with my friends and I don't know how much money they had. They're, they're about five years older than me, but I was like, yeah, we're like trying to figure out what to do with our money. And we have like this sum and I don't know if they were impressed or not impressed or whatever. Like technically they pro they, they were better employees than me. So I think they earned more and they were five years older. So they should have been like already conquering that situation, I guess. That said, when we did have like a, a solid chunk of money trying to figure out where to invest it, I think I started to feel wealthy around then. I also, I think around that time we were figuring out what was important to us. So we could cut back on things we didn't care about and prioritize things that we did like food, right? So I'll spend money on food. We would go out to eat to nicer places or whatever, but it, I would just see maybe a nice steak and feel totally fine, like buying a nice steak at the store because I know that I could do a good job cooking and cooking it at home and all that kind of stuff. So, so that was it. I think after that point, I was like, we're in good shape. Like if we just keep on the same path, like we'll continue, it'll just pay off. And we stumbled upon, I think Pete's blog and just, so like, hey, index fund investing is probably a smart way to do it. Just keep it simple. And 
then whatever, eight years later, a good eight years in the market, we were in a completely different position. And to your point, I think at the the age that we are, like hitting 1 million in net worth is like a milestone. Probably in the future, it'll be, I don't know what it'll be, like 2 million or inflation's crazy, right? 5 million, I'm not sure what it'll be, but like 1 million sounds like a lot. Yeah. It's a good demarcation. So we both earn money aside from our investments. My blog makes a little bit of money. You have some side hustles. If if someone came down and said, you're not allowed to earn another dollar aside from your investments, would that give you anxiety? No, no. And I'll tell you some stories off the record because I like to have my stories formed and I'm in the middle of one right now. So I won't share it here, but I would have no anxiety at all. If you were like, don't make any money ever again, I'd be cool with it. If you were like, no money for a year, I'd be cool with that. Anything where I'm doing less stuff, I'm I'm on board. Sign me up. It, I think that's pretty important too, because I think I finally became comfortable with not earning any money aside from investments pretty recently, but I think you know when you've made it. And I think that might be another way that you feel real wealthy. You truly have enough where you don't feel like you have to hustle or do any of this other silly shit to bring in and to throw more money on top of the pile. Yeah. And when you look at, you know, you said you had the the 5 million net worth a couple years ago, you didn't feel wealthy the problem is when you look at the compound interest table in the graph, it's like, you got to start spending, man, or else you're going to have $50 million in, you know, by the, hopefully you, you'll live a long life, but you're going to have like a shitload of money, right? Did that bring you any comfort? Like knowing, like you were, you were past the point of where you needed to be. And the compound interest was at a critical mass where it was going to explode if you didn't start getting rid of money. Yeah, funny enough, I, I remember having those thoughts and I think I was talking to JL Collins once, not on a podcast or anything, but he's like, if you keep going, he said something almost exactly what you just said, you're going to have this much, like X amount, a huge amount. And I don't think that, uh, I think I brushed it off. I don't think that made any difference. And I don't think I felt bad about the situation, felt very good. I just didn't feel wealthy. Gotcha. Does it matter if you feel wealthy or not? I think it does. I, I think it really does, Doug, because if you don't feel wealthy, if you're not going to come to grips with how much money you have, you might be depriving yourself of experiences. Or one thing that you like to say, Doug, that I appreciate is you don't have to add fancy things to your life. You can take stuff away. Like we've tried to outsource as much work as possible. We've hired a cleaner and done all these things that have added a lot of value to our life. So it's adding value by subtraction, which I think is Great, but if I didn't feel wealthy, I'm not sure we would have done those things. And as a as a side point, I don't disagree with you. That's cool. As a, a nuanced part of the conversation, I think you don't have to, in quotes, feel wealthy. I think you just have to feel confident in the abundance that you could earn more money or that you're planning for decades will carry you through and you have flexibility to make sure everything's going to be okay. So as long as you don't feel scarce about the money or like your needs are not going to be met, I think you're probably okay. Cause I think like some people maybe like their, their upbringing or something like they're just not going to be able to feel in quotes wealthy. I don't know. What do you think? No, I think that's a great point, Doug. We talked to Diana about this and it's so strange how we put so much emphasis and I'm looking at myself here, but others too, we put so much emphasis on that one number and it's something that's almost completely out of our control. We might be able to add something to it. We might be able to become a little bit more frugal so we don't decrease the numbers fast, but we're all counting on stock market returns and the 4% rule of thumb and stuff like that. But that whole thing, we have no control over that, but yet we obsess over it. it. Diana says this all the time. Why don't we obsess over ourselves instead, our our network of people, the skills we've built up in our lives? And another way to frame this conversation, I was talking to someone at Camp Fi, at the Camp Fi outside of San Diego, and she's like, why would I be concerned at all about my life now? 
what, what I should have been concerned was the day I got out of college because I had, I didn't have a job. I didn't have any skills. I didn't have any experience banked up and I, I had a negative net worth. So now I'm two decades out of that. I've got tons of skills. I've got a network. I've got money. So I should have, therefore, I should have no worries about anything. And I think that's another way to frame what Diana has to say. We should count on all these great things about ourselves that we can control and just have a little imagination and confidence in ourselves instead of relying on this silly number. And as a, as a teaser for potentially a future episode, for me personally, some of the most rewarding stretches of my life and just fun times. It was when I was working in the national park and I was making like five bucks an hour. We lived in a shitty old motel. We had roommates and I was in debt. I was still in school, but we had a blast every day. It was fucking so fun. My commute to work was like driving up a mountain. And I think we could, I don't know if you have the same experience, but I recently watched American Beauty, which is a 1999 movie. I really liked it at the time and I wasn't sure if it aged well, but there is a portion that I really enjoyed. It's an old movie, but I'm not going to give any spoilers. The main character ends up quitting his job and working at a Smiley Burger, a burger place, because he was like, I had the best times when I was broke. I worked at a burger place and it was a blast. So he was like, I'm going to do that. And he started working at the counter, just, you know, just hawking burgers back and forth. And I was like, yeah, like usually it's just sim it's simple. It's not like we have all this stuff and we needed to get the car to be happy or whatever. It was like who you're around, what you're doing. And it was a blast. Do you have a, you have a time like that? Yeah, I think you're exactly right. Like in college, like super debt, but we just, we'd go during the week and they'd have these crappy bands like on Tuesday night and they'd have, like, you could get a big thing of beer for like a dollar. And man, those were some of my favorite memories. We just walked there and walk home, like study hard in the afternoon and life was so simple. You had the dorm, so you had a place to stay, they had food. So you just focused on your studies and and stuff like that, going out with friends and hanging out, like just conversations in the dorm room and stuff like that. It was a simple life. I, I think we lose track sometimes and get too uh, entangled in all the stuff that happens when we have to become adults and f forget how fun and easy the simplicity was. So the pin that we'll put for a future show and potentially a new book, we've talked about this. We got to finish the first book and everything, but the specific topic of like why simpler, like a simpler life with less money when we were younger was so awesome. And I don't like, I don't know if we'll be able to investigate that, but that could be something where we ask a bunch of different people, get their input. And yeah, I don't, I don't know if you could like even recreate it. Cause now we have all this, this baggage as middle-aged people. So I wonder if there are people trying to recreate it. Like, uh, the guy here who came to Colorado that's trying to establish a communal community where you just rent a house and live a simple life with a bunch of hopefully like-minded people. I don't think it's quite the same, but maybe it's getting back to some of that simplicity and community. Interesting. All right. I think that's it for today. Any other thoughts, Carl? No, that's all. Thanks for listening to the show. That was the Mile High Five podcast and I'm Doug Cunnington the Balder host, and Carl Jensen is the cool, sexy one. If you dig the show, please do three things for us. Number one, tell a friend, a family member, an enemy about the show. We really don't care who you tell. Maybe forward them a specific show that you know that they will like. It's the single most helpful thing that you can do to spread the word. It's like giving us a virtual high five, and uh, actually we don't give high fives in, in person, so the virtual kind's pretty good. And more importantly, your friend or family member or even your enemy will appreciate the fact that you were thinking of them. Number two, make sure you're following or subscribed on your podcast app, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Overcast, YouTube, whatever you're using, and that way you won't miss a show. And number three, please leave us a rating and review. We read them on the show occasionally, and you might hear yours out there on an upcoming episode. Quick disclaimer. 
This show is not financial or legal advice. I'd actually be surprised if it sounded like it. It's really just for entertainment, and that's at least what we're hoping for. But seriously, get advice from professionals. Carl and I are just two guys with microphones that sit in my basement and talk. So we'll catch y'all next week. All right, Carl. So it's been very cold. I try not to talk about too much seasonality or whatever. So when people listen to this in the future, it'll make sense. But right now here in Colorado, it's been very, very cold, like about zero degrees Fahrenheit for several days or colder. So to, today when I woke up, it was like negative 14 or 15 degrees. And we do have a newer home, so there's no pipes near the wall, but we are we are a little paranoid, so we've left the water dripping. And I told you not too long ago that we have been putting a bucket in the shower to catch that water while it heats up. So then we'll use that water to water plants or you know other things that are appropriate to use that water for, like fill a humidifier, whatever. So we're letting the faucet drip in the shower in one of the bathrooms, And we are trying to reclaim all that water. So at this point, I think I have like 16 gallons of water or something like that. Because it's been days, right? And it's fucking cold. You don't want your pipes to freeze or whatever. So what are your thoughts on this approach? Because you saw this, right? I did. I I went upstairs and I assumed assumed you had a plumbing problem. And that was, I got into DIY because my shower faucet did the same thing. It leaked. But it... It wasn't turned on. It was just leaking. It wasn't broken. I know, or it was broken. Yours is not broken. So I saw that. I'm like, oh man, I can, I can help Doug. I could tell him how to fix this. But I saw that. And have you ever seen the movie Dune or read that book before? No. Oh, okay. So all the people in that book live on a desert planet, and water is like one of the most precious things. So they even have suits that recapture all their moisture. So they breathe out, and these these suits recapture. All the water. So I'm picturing you right now <laughs> in this dune suit. I think they call it a still suit in there and yeah. riding on a big sandworm because that's that's the other thing they do in the book. They ride on worms. This, this conversation is taking a turn you never <laughs> expected. Uh, yeah, yeah. So we have a ton of water and I'm like, I feel weird. Say Like we'll, like we'll be able to turn that off and stop re- reclaiming all this water. But it's a lot. It's a lot. And luckily I had a couple of like giant coolers and some other brewing equipment. So I actually have like the capacity to hold like whatever, 50 gallons of water if I wanted to. I'm not going to take it that far. At some point, we don't want standing water just laying around. So we'll use all this pretty quickly. I just got to say, Doug, I think you're a little crazy because I'm looking at the pipes that feed that right now and they're in this basement, which is 60 degrees. So I think there are certain things you can do. And that you should do, but this is probably not one of them because that particular thing is not going to freeze. Yeah, I've had this debate. I lost the battle, if you know what I'm saying, in in this discussion. Because like you get the emails and they're like, oh, what's your water drip? It's like the house was built like three years ago. Like there's no pipes anywhere close. Like even the crawl space is like 50 degrees or something like that. Or actually, it's on the same line it's like the same temperature in the crawl space as it is here so like no pipes have any issue of freezing unless they're like you know out outside buried so i think we're all right do you let anything drip at your place uh no do you take the hoses off your exterior spigots or yeah okay that's what you should do and the other thing i do is i actually had a, a spigot freeze up and this was an extreme situation very very cold and very high wind and the spigot, some water actually in there did freeze up. It might have not been the water tight one, but I, or I'm sorry, the weather tight one, because mm-hmm. I won't go into this, but there's ones that aren't supposed to do that. And I think this was actually a good one. It shouldn't have done that, but it actually froze. So what I do is I put a shut off inside the house. And when wintertime comes, I shut it off and then open the spigot. So there's no chance of that happening. So if you are going to be concerned with anything, that should be it. And I think... We have those spigots, but yeah, there's sometimes manufacturing failures or whatever, but that would be the one thing. And I I don't think we can turn, we could turn off our irrigation line, but I don't think we could turn off the two spigots that we have. But anyway, we could investigate later. Anyway, it's really weird. I have a ton of water and (laughs) we're just gathering it up. It's a huge amount. If you need any water, you're welcome to it. I appreciate that.